We just finished a talk on RDMA support in SMB3, so I think this was a very useful thing to, uh, to hear about. And um, you know, I think that was a very interesting talk before that from Microsoft on some of the uh, upcoming protocol extensions. Gives us something to catch up to and keep up with. Okay, so I'm gonna focus on the Linux client today and uh, also mention to some extent, the Unix extensions that we're driving toward. Uh, we'll have a longer talk tomorrow on that where we'll focus more on, the, uh, on those extensions. And uh, Jeremy and Allison and I will, uh, will do that. And I think also you guys know that we're gonna be able to demonstrate some of the, the client uh, features tomorrow to um, Azure. So as you guys know, I've been doing this a long time. I wrote the original Linux client uh, as well as uh, some pieces of Samba years ago with Jim and others. Uh, we have Samba team people here as well. And it's been kind of an exciting year. This has been an interesting year to watch. I'm gonna talk about some of the feature status, what works, some of the POSIX uh, extensions we've been bouncing around, uh, uh, and then a little bit on the timeline. So as you know, we're in a storage conference. NAS is a smaller part of that. SMB3 is a smaller part of it still, but we're driven by these set of features, right? We just heard RDMA. Obviously, the previous talk, we talked a little bit about NVMe, DAX, direct access stuff, and many of the changes that have been going on. For example, <coughs> StatX. If you were at the Kernel File System Summit this year, there was a lot of discussion of StatX. So all of these general file system features and storage features have an impact on what we do in the protocol, how we implement these modules, and they're very important not to lose sight of because file systems without these things, apps break, and we don't take advantage of these um, very, very exciting features. I think you know everybody wants their data faster, and this is incredible, some of the numbers we've been talking about. When you step back and think about it, being able to access, I mean, just think about one thing from that presentation just before we're accessing with almost 90%, like 88% of the bandwidth of a network adapter that was faster than, you know, we haven't had network adapters that speed 10 years ago. And, you know, if we're running on a 100 gig adapter or we're running with multi-channel, you know, we're hoping in the long run to be able to, uh, to do the kind of thing where, you know, that Blu-ray drive, that 20 gig movie you wanted to watch, I don't know, where's Jeremy? He usually has those things, right? So that movie you wanted to watch transfers, you know, in seconds. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the kernel itself. I, you know, we live in a, I live in a world where I get emails from Linus about SMB3 protocol things, as you guys saw last week. Um, and it's, it's a different world than the storage world and file system world. We have psychotic stone sheep. So that was what they called, for some bizarre reason, the kernel a year ago when we were having this discussion. Now we're at this fearless coyote, whatever that means. So these are the names in the kernel make file that give a sort of symbolic way of you understanding where the kernel is. I kind of like the idea that we're at a fearless coyote better than a stone sheep as we were a year ago. It just seems somehow wrong. But these are, uh, you know, we live in this world. And by the way, one thing we don't talk about, because there are Linux people here. I think you guys saw Christoph and you saw some of the, the file system developers in Linux. This Ceph maintainer was here. But I think what is not often realized is how good this team is. This group is a very good group. So this is, you know, in Cambridge, you know, right next to MIT, uh, at the summit that we attended um, earlier this spring. It's a great group of developers, and there's very interesting work going on. But now the question is, okay, we got these great storage features being done here. We have some amazing work being done in Samba to interoperate with Windows. There's some fantastic protocol extensions that are being discussed. But how do we integrate these, right? We've got some great stuff going on in Linux, but we've got to integrate that work into our kernel, maybe even provide helper modules if needed for Samba, but allow Samba and allow Windows to be accessed from Linux optimally. Each one of these guys is working on different stuff, right? A lot of these guys have, you know, they don't know how to spell SMB3, right? But they're doing work that enables us to do fantastic things with SMB3 to Windows, Samba, and, uh, NetApp, and others. So where do they do their work? You know, the kernel community I live in, who knew 
you know, that ButterFS is still the most active file system. XFS next. But XFS is way up from last year in activity. 530 patches to get through a kernel review process is pretty amazing. And the NFS client, as you might guess, gets lots of patches as well. NetApp, Red Hat, and others driving lots of patchwork into the NFS client. EXT4, activity's up a lot, but it's you know, number four on the list here of most active file systems, partly because it doesn't have as many features as XFS and ButterFS. But I think it's fascinating to see this and then to look at SMB2, right? We had, we're one, two, three, four, five, six, right? We're sixth file system on the list of most active. We got 55 or 60 file systems in Linux and this SMB3 support is the sixth most active. Um, 44,000 lines of code, relatively small. We depend on user space for a lot of things, right? We depend on user space for some of the Kerberos enablement, for example, um, some of that SPNego code. And we have some user space libraries and tools, but the kernel code alone is, is, a, is a very carefully watched thing. One of the cool things about being in the kernel world is you get you know, your Intel zero day vulnerability emails automatically sent to you five minutes after you check in the wrong patch or screw something up. You get, uh, you know, a code scanning type stuff sent to you very quickly. It's kind of fun, but this stuff gets watched surprisingly carefully. I'm also fascinated, the NFS server, activity's down a little bit, 140 patches. Samba, did we have more than 140 patches? Maybe one or two more than that. <laughs> Now, anyway, the NFS server, it is carefully watched, but, but uh, you know, these, um, you know, Samba in user space just completely blows this list away, right? Um, Mets alone, you probably, and you probably had more than, you know, some of this, right? But, you know, it's an interesting perspective to look at where the activity is. File systems are about 5%, a little over 5% of the kernel, but they're a huge percentage of the activity in the kernel from the point of view of eyes looking at stuff. You know, the MM layer and the file system layer get a lot more eyes. The kernel may be 15 million lines of code, but there's a lot of device drivers you don't care about. This, um, this portion of the kernel is, uh, you know, there's a lot of, uh, I don't know how to, a polite way to put it, but there's a lot of uh, contentious activity on that. So what are our goals? Well, one goal is to move us to SMB311 everywhere we can. Not quite there yet. Mets helped out a lot at some of the last test events. If you look at Samba 4.7, Samba 4.7, we're now negotiating 3.1.1 a lot more. But we did at least move to SMB3. We want the best pragmatic interoperability. There are things that are gonna fail because you know, we have to make some trade-offs, but that needs to be very small. And we have some easy performance work and the RDMA work we've talked about. Some of the compounding work that Aureliana and I have talked about and others have talked about, Pavel, we can get in. But there are lots of small performance things now that we've moved to SMB3 that we need to focus on. And also extending the set of user space tools, so things like, I don't know, enumerating snapshots, querying certain things, setting, um, setting ACLs, these sorts of things are a little bit easier. We have a lot of user space tools. We have them for backup applications for setting and getting ACLs and such, but we need more work on the user space tools. And by the way, did we mention anything about confusing names? We still call it SIFs. You know? I know, it's really weird. And, and by the way, when you Google third-party NAS servers and you're looking at their stuff, a lot of times they're calling stuff SIFs that's really SMB2 or SMB3. You know, I think everybody's gonna nod their head about that one. It gets really confusing. Yeah, so you have people that are blocking what they think is SIFs because they're totally confused about naming just to remind you, SMB3 is the default dialect. Going forward in Samba, SMB311 is, you know, we want to make sure we don't imply that we're using uh, a wonderful old program, a protocol that I was the chair for, right, years ago, but we, SIFS is out. And I think you guys saw the t-shirts. Is anybody wearing the t-shirt from the uh, plug fest? So you got your little, you know, wanna cry. Oh yeah, good, so just to remind you guys, SIFS is, SIF, SMB1 makes me want to cry. So we don't want to be talking about SIFS, but it confuses the heck out of people. I have to admit that SIFS has not been a security exposure as far as I can tell for many things that I deal with every day. On the other hand, 
um, we all could break the passwords quite quickly if we wanted to. Um, so guessing at the password hashes wouldn't be too hard uh, with today's computers. So it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing, um, but certainly there is reason to move forward. SMB 3.1 is a nice, secure, well-designed protocol. We should be using it. Okay, so dialect upgrade. It's new behavior. Got lots of, um, not angry mail exactly, but we got some contention about that uh, last week. It is now official. The current kernel that's out uses SMB 3. And you get a message log. You didn't specify a dialect. Just note, this is the message you're getting. Uh, next release, we're going to have the multi-protocol. The reason we didn't do this is the last test event, we ran into some problems doing validate and negotiate. The validate and negotiate IOCTL prevents us from having downgrade attacks. When you send one dialect, you obviously can't really have a downgraded attack. With these multiple protocols, we have to be able to send the, the validate and negotiate and minimize the probability of, uh, but it's a little bit tricky the way SIFS implement, or the way the, the module, SIFS.ko, implements this. Uh, to do that. So that patch was deferred to this next release. And uh, you know, the SMB 3.1.1, Edgar, who has been very helpful at Microsoft, uh, has been helping us work through that. Um, and we're going to be at Redmond next week, hopefully finishing that off. Okay, so last year we had a to-do list. Okay, So prefix path is yes, that's done. Improved POSIX compatibility. We, we got some work in progress. Um, so even without the Unix extensions, we made some good progress in um, you know, fixes for obscure things that no one would have thought about, trailing spaces, trailing periods, things that are legal in POSIX but not in... Um, we made some good improvement there. Um, we can expose some of the, uh, the attributes um, via an etc. Uh, the reconnect support has gotten much better. Some of the guys like Citrix and others that were, that were testing at some of these events, they... Um, and Red Hat and SUSE, they found a set of problems doing really nasty things to servers. You know, rebooting them in the middle of stuff, rebooting clients in strange ways, rebooting servers in strange ways, killing network connections in automated fashion. So there are a lot of fixes that went in to stabilize, reconnect, and improve the support for durable and persistent handles in the client. Encrypted share support in, and ACLs, uh, in SMB3 support for ACLs and querying the mode from ACLs and various security improvements. So we got most of that list done, almost all of it done, of what we promised from last year. Now, but what are you going to see the most, what's the most noticeable? Well, the dialect upgrade, of course, right? You're going to mount, you're not going to get SIFs. Some things will be worse, a few things will be worse because you don't have the POSIX extensions, but many, many things are better now. And the SMB3 support is much improved, but it's also much more secure and for read and write paths, much faster. I think we talked last year about some of the performance improvements that Pavel and others have done. It's really neat to see. Async IO, not async IO, the SMB3 performance um, is quite good for read and write. So we've talked about some of these, um, you know, what's changed by release. Well, we can go back a few years if we want. Um, I think that the, um, you know, being able to do copy offload across shares, okay, that's nice. There's some cool stuff here get a little bit closer to, to modern time here, a year and a half ago. Um, I think this, uh, this bad lock regression in 4.7 for guest mounts um, is kind of interesting. The prefix path changes, but I think very, very important was the 4.8 change here to add support for MF sim links. A lot of people use sim links, and MF, Minchel French, the Conrad Minchel at Apple and I, um, we had a, a emulation for symlinks so the server doesn't have to support it. And this emulation um, allows you to do symlinks to servers that don't support POSIX directly. But it also works nicely to Macs. Um, so it, it's a good way of having client followed symlinks that, uh, you know, a feature that was available with our POSIX extensions and SIFs but not with SMB3. Okay, so going forward closer to uh, current time. We added some kind of an interesting thing. You can enumerate snapshots now. The idea being eventually to be able to mount um, with a snapshot um, as, you know, basically to, to see an older version of files. Um, a lot of neat reconnect improvements in 4.11. So we had some controversy about clone range. Clone range 
uh, was introduced as a way of getting around a BTRFS specific IOCTL that we implemented uh, for copy offload. Copy offload is extremely important for SMB workloads, and we can do it multiple ways. We can do it, uh, actually there's three or four ways you can do it, various versions of, of SIFs and SMB3. The copy chunk style of offload was re-enabled, so now CP-reflink now works again and is much, much faster. So, you know, having something work a thousand times faster, a copy, is a good thing. And uh, so I think that's a very visible thing. Uh, Aurelia here added support for DFS, thank you, back in 4.11. And then Pavel, the encryption support in 4.11. These were obviously very important. I think having per share encryption and per server encryption is a really neat feature. So fast forwarding to 4.12, what did we get? We had uh, additional SMB3 names. These crazy Apple people keep finding characters that are legal in POSIX but illegal in Windows, right? So these Apple guys find these stuff. And you know, there's a mapping strategy for this. So for example, above Fox Fox 00, you can take these things like greater than, less than, colon, map them up into this reserve range so they can magically go across the wire and give Jeremy heart failure if they have any security implications because you've now bypassed security stuff. So needless to say, Samba has to be very, very careful about taking those and mapping them back. But currently, these sort of opaque looking names uh, store nicely in Samba and store nicely in Windows and allow you to have support for illegal POSIX, sorry, legal POSIX characters that are illegal in Windows. Legal. Um, let's see, default dialect change in 4.13. The SIFS ACL mount option, um, Sharish finished that off. The SIFS ACL mount option allows you to Query the mode, for example, from an ACL. I'll show you that in a few minutes. Okay. Xadder enablement is now checked in. Ronnie Salberg uh, of Wireshark and LibNFS and LibSCSI and Samba team fame uh, is now doing some really cool SIF stuff. And Ronnie, uh, this worked for SIFs, but now we have it for SMB3. Although, something that Aurelian and I and others should probably look at later. I was running one of the XFS tests today, and one of the XAdder tests fails, possibly because of case sensitivity. You know, whether XAdders are case sensitive or not is a, is a kind of a protocol issue. So coming soon, what's very important? You saw the RDMA presentation. I'm very excited about that. Um, we have a talk tomorrow about the POSIX extensions. We keep shrinking them down smaller and smaller. A mandatory set of features relatively not controversial, and everything that can be done non-POSIX through SMB emulation is being used to keep that set small. So we're getting closer to that. There's been lots of discussions this week on it again. Um, also the multi-dialect support, so we don't have to force SMB3 on you. The, the pushback we got was that SMB2.1 is used by Windows 7. Windows 7 has a huge install base, and I think there's some Macs out there even that support SMB2.1. There's some NetApp filers that only support SMB2.1. Mounting to those today, you have to specify, you know, verse equals um, to one. They were okay with the idea that if you're trying to map mount to Windows 2000 or Windows XP, you might have to specify a verse. But these relatively more recent servers, like Windows 7, uh, maybe four, five, six-year-old servers, uh, it was a little bit annoying. So being able to support this set of dialects, 21, 30, 302 initially, and then as we finish the 311 off, being able to send all of those will should be um, very close, that patch set is being reviewed. Okay, so we've had an argument forever about getting StatX in the kernel. Samba, I think we brought it up every file system summit for like five years. Um, and you know, this is something Samba's wanted for a long, long time. It's in, Dave Howells of Red Hat did it. Um, you know, SIFS enablement's plan, we're not quite there. This allows us to retrieve some of the attribute bits in user space through standard Linux tools that are already available in SIFS and SMB3. And it's extensible, so more flags can come if we have additional metadata we want to be able to query in user space from standard tools through the SIFS client to Samba or Windows. Well, a good example is today we can request um, what compressed and encrypted flags, for example. Um, and. Um, I think, what was the other example we had? The creation time, right? So these, these sorts of things, um, we can do a set and get today of the compressed flag. That code was done by one of the Samba team guys, 
and it allowed you to do it through an ext2 ioctl. But it's not exactly standard because it's not the stat call. So the stat call wouldn't report that this file is compressed. Well, we know it's compressed, and I can show you it's compressed with certain SIF specific tools. But if I wanted you to run, you know, on SIFs or an SMB3 mount, wanted you to run a normal Windows tool, sorry, normal Linux tool, you know, the extended stat user space tool, you can now see it's compressed. You can see it's creation time. So the set of flags that were done was intentionally shrunk. A year and a half ago, there was a big argument, I think Jeremy might have even been there, about the no bike shedding. Keep the set of things small for StatX. So there are relatively few things we care about, but there's a couple attribute flags in creation time. Uh, and more flags are coming. So thank you, Dave Howells, on this. What, what it matters to us is that certain things that we're used to dealing with every single day in a Windows client, every single day in a, in a SMB server, are now visible to user space in standard Linux tools. So what about snapshots? So we added the support to enumerate snapshots, SMB 2.1 or later. And we added this mount parm, but allowing you to mount with, uh, you know, where the snapshot stuff is appended on, so you can, you know, basically get a previous version of a file if it existed. We're most of the way there. You can enumerate them today. Not quite finished. Okay, so what about the SIFS ACL thing I mentioned that Cherish did recently? So today you can mount with the SIFS ACL mount option, and you can get the mode bits implied from the ACL. Now, one of the things we talked about a lot in you know, Jeremy's discussions and discussions with Microsoft is we prefer using the ACL where possible. And there's been multiple ways that the ACL has been pulled out of a, you know, basically we, we basically retrieve the ACL out of a, a file. Uh, sorry, retrieve the mode out of the ACL. So the mode is largely a subset of the ACL. There are, there's some arguments about this, but in general, you can detect that the owner has read or write permission. You can detect that the group owner has a certain permission. You can detect whether everyone has read or write permission. And rather than inventing some POSIX thing over the wire, it's kind of easier a lot of times to use the ACL. Similarly, it's you know, easier to use SIDS a lot of times than it is to use UIDs. But I wanted to show you an example of what happens today. OK, so here's a local directory on Ubuntu, current kernel from a week ago, right? This is the most recent kernel. So I have a file with mode 700, mode 700, mode 777, mode 777. Okay, so the file name implies what it is. Now, what happens if we look at it today with Sharish's, with SMB3, with the with uh, the uh, SIFS ACL mount option? 700 mode shows it up at 700 mode. 44 shows up at 44. 777, shows up seven, everything looks right. Except for, notice that everybody is shown as owned by root, because we defaulted to that ID. We can recognize a special Unix SID that has the owner embedded within the SID, the UID, GID owner embedded in the SID. But one of the changes we need to do is make it easier for a user to mount in a way that gets the real owner versus the owner for the mount. Since we're not querying the UID, right, we need to be returning the SID, the POSIX extensions will return the SID, we need to be able to translate the SID owner into a local person. Now, if we don't have SIFS ACL, the, we can kind of partly emulate 4.4, you know, that set is, um, you know, that's, that's not quite the mode we had, but it's at least we have the read-only bit we can play around with for that, but all the others are wrong, right? So you can see that without SIFS ACL, we can't do the mode bits. With SIFS ACL, mode's perfect. So today, not an issue getting the mode. The owner can be an issue, but with the Unix extensions, won't be an issue at all. Okay, so what's the to-do list? We have some security things. Finishing up 3.1.1, secure negotiates, a big thing. Uh, performance, especially compounding. I don't know how many of you guys trace uh, the Mac client, experiment with a Mac client. I'm sure some of you guys do. Notice, you know, I was just looking at, I'll show you, I have a Wireshark trace later. It's kind of cool. They just <laughs> compound to their heart, they compound a lot. And, um, you know, it's important to, uh, to do that. We have, uh, uh, we're partway along on that. 
Now, what works? What about XFS test? What does XFS test currently show as missing or broken? So I ran it a little bit earlier today. I need to um, do a longer run with it. Um, there's a couple things I noticed. One was that uh, there are some F allocate cases where we're not uh, exposing support for a couple things that are doable. Um, there's a couple places where we're not exposing POSIX ACLs. Okay, so fine, I'll, I'll live without POSIX ACLs. Those tests will skip. Uh, there are some that only are appropriate for local file systems. I'm fine with that. Um, one of the symlink cases didn't recognize that symlinks were turned on. That needs a little more investigation. But with the X adder enablement, you know, we should get farther. But we did find a failure in X adder's generic 20, for example. We have support for it, but it failed, probably due to case sensitivity in, in X adders. Um, but I do see significant improvement. So we had a uh, a list posted in a wiki on samba.org from a year and a half ago of the expected results, lots and lots of data, uh, and it has made big improvement in. So XFS test, despite its name, is the standard functional test bucket for, you know, there used to be Connectathon and FS test and others. Now they're all lumped into one Mongo thing with 500 subtests in it. And many of these will never run over SIFs because they're designed for block devices, but um, the majority of them can run, uh, and then some of them are skipped because of, of features we don't support. And our goal here is to keep reducing that set of features, you know, getting the mode bits working, for example, big deal, getting sim links, getting X adder support, continuing to drive features into the code, new F allocate subfunctions so we get more and more of this XFS test running, in order that somebody who only knows EXT4 or XFS or Ceph or something else, when they're running it on SIFs, doesn't get confused. They're on an SMB3 mount, they don't care. They're just running the standard test bucket and they can notice regressions in their server without having to be experts in you know, the kernel SMB3 driver. I mentioned F allocate, I don't want to go into too much detail on this, but the two that we don't support, collapse range and insert range, uh, we could support for REFS style file systems that support block ref counting because we could do tricks where we collapse the range and insert the range using um, you know, the, the copy chunk, the clone, the clone range call. Okay, so what does POSIX compatibility look like now? Today we can already handle, and we'll talk about this more tomorrow with Jeremy uh, in that presentation, but we can already handle all the path, these path cards, greater than, less than, asterisk, whatever. We escape them the Mac way. We handle hard links. We can retrieve the mode. Uh, we, do, we just showed you all that. Now, if the UID is well known, we can retrieve that. Uh, otherwise, we're going to need to do up calls to retrieve it from the SID and have the SID sent back on uh, the Unix query info call. And, you know, we can emulate, rename, and delete semantics, but there's some corner cases where a silly rename and the normal NFS strategy doesn't work, uh, where, you know, rename's going to get or delete's going to get an access denied where it shouldn't. Uh, but we emulate it fairly, fairly closely, but this is another area where the POSIX semantics help. What can't we handle? Well, we can't handle case sensitive paths. What is this needed for? Well, have you ever tried building the kernel? You try building the kernel, it uses duplicate file names that only differ in case. So, sorry, we gotta have, you know, we're case preserving, but we gotta have case sensitive paths. What about POSIX bright range locking? It's helpful. There are some apps that, that use it. We can you know, obviously just do it on the client and not send it to the server if we want, um, advisory locks, but if you wanna have these shared across <coughs> you know, these advisory locks, uh, or OFD locks, um, in reality, probably, sent across the wire, then we're going to have to, uh, um, you know, have this Unix extension that Jeremy and I and others have been discussing. And similarly, there's a couple flags, a couple fields, uh, you know, the link count uh, in stat and in statfs, there's a few things like uh, maximum inodes and stuff. There's a, there's a couple fields in statfs. And also remember that when I talk about these structures like stat and statfs and what works and what doesn't, I'm looking at it from the point of view of the system call which may be different than your favorite tool. The fact that ls might not display this, or stat, the command line tool, might not display it, doesn't mean the syscall works, right? Because the syscall can have stuff that the user space tool of its favorite of the day doesn't return. So, um, you know, with both stat and statfs, when we've been talking about Unix extensions, we're talking more about what comes back from the kernel, not necessarily what your favorite tool displays. So sometimes it may be one or two fields you're not familiar with, but that are, you know, all file systems return. 
And of course, this exact semantics of POSIX delete and rename uh, will make me a lot happier. And the good news is, um, you know, we're getting closer. Now, what are we talking about here? A create, we're talking about a negotiate context that, this, that is sent on negotiate protocol, SMB311. And as Jeremy, I think, was talking with uh, the Microsoft guys today, we, you know, it could also be on the tree connect context if we support that in the future. This context has an ID that indicates what version, basically, so we, we have one version of the POSIX extensions. This ID of the create context enables behavior. If you support this, then you will either succeed or fail when I send you a POSIX open with a POSIX create context. So you see an SMB3 open with a POSIX create context, you're either gonna succeed or fail. You're not gonna ignore the POSIX context. And that's needed so you don't end up accidentally deleting files due to case sensitivity or some such. Um, so you don't want unexpected behavior by having a server say it supports POSIX and then find out that you're on a subdirectory that doesn't support POSIX. If you're on a subdirectory that doesn't support POSIX, you need to return an error for that um, rather than ignoring the POSIX create context. When you succeed a POSIX create, that meant you have on this handle, you have POSIX delete rename uh, and byte range locks. Uh, it means you support case sensitivity and the POSIX uh, query info and query directory info levels. Those are kind of well known for people who remember the SIFS Unix extensions that have been around for many years. The mode comes from the ACL. So these level, you know, there are a few things that uh, we don't have to return the same way. And notice the owner is the SID, not a UID. Symlinks are client followed, so these guys over here and Jeremy don't have heart failure, dealing with your latest security bug. MF Symlinks is the first one, but as Samba supports it, Windows NFS Symlink reparse point is also available. Um, and the SFM mapping is used for POSIX characters. What? You disagree? Yes. Okay, what? Um, for example, asterisk. No. So you want just them sent without mapping? Okay, I can do that. Yeah. So, so one of the things that we talked about is server and client perspective. From the client perspective, it's easier not to map, but we're trying to put ourselves in the server shoes. If the server guys really believe that on a POSIX handle, we don't have to remap anything, sounds good to me. Um, so I prefer not to remap, and having the server perspective is valuable, which is why we're having the talk tomorrow. So Jeremy can, uh, because it makes my life easier to do that, but we don't want to make the server guys harder. Okay, now, just for completion, it is possible to use Apple's stuff. And yes, in Samba, we support this. So notice the wonderful amount of compounding here. You know, you're seeing Microsoft doing lots of stuff in one SMB. And this isn't maybe the best example, but here we have a, a, a create context request from you know, an Apple client to an Apple server. And as you can see, this gets you some, but not enough, of the behaviors. And in the response, you can see you know, they're the server path to this file. They've got a few interesting things that we could uh, we can use in the Linux client when we're mounting to Samba or another server as a fallback. The intent though for AAPL would be that we do the POSIX extensions well using the Unix extensions that we were talking about. If the server doesn't support them, we can always try the AAPL context if you specify a mount option. The AAPL context doesn't provide you all of the POSIX semantics, but it does imply some. Um, and it is a fallback, but I wanted to just not forget that completely because you know, it is there. Um, so what about performance? So I highlighted the things um, that are focus areas, compounding. We have a place in our code where we do open query close, stat. In the good old SIFS world, which we used to use until like two weeks ago, you had query path info, one call. You had set path info, one call instead of three. Um, it's a big deal. As you saw in the Mac trace just a second ago, they use it a lot, even more than Windows. Large file I.O. looks good. Async and vector I.O. looks good. Uh, file leases look good, but we don't support lease upgrades. Directory leases, we really should be asking for directory leases. There's, that's something we've talked about off and on for a while. Asking for directory leasing, and we have a, a piece of code in the client that, that does a, uh, 
um, you know, invalidate dentry. Is the, is the is our inode metadata still valid? You know, we give it one second. So we're a little stricter than NFS and some others, but we give it one second and we cache the data. Here with direct releases, we can cache it a lot longer. Copy offload, looks good, fantastic stuff. We support multiple mechanisms for that. Um, Multi-channel, we can query the info, but as you saw from the RDMA presentation, we don't fully support multi-channel. But this RDMA mount option looks really exciting. And then of course, we need some Linux-specific protocol optimizations um, you know, as we think about how we can better optimize real workloads. Okay, so from just highlighting some of the things from the talk uh, just before this, you guys notice 88% network utilization. Wasn't quite as good as Windows, but it was really close. For a first pass, I thought that was fantastic. 88% network utilization on read versus 90% on Windows, and 70% utilization on write. Given the relatively small changes he's made to the core um, SIFs and SMB3 code, that's pretty good. So I think this is quite exciting. Our performance for async I.O. is very good, but RDMA allows us to lower our CPU utilization so much uh, while also getting a little bit better performance over the wire. So I think this is a, you know, the plan. Let's start merging this stuff soon. Some of the low-risk protocol definitions may even go in this week if we can get uh, you know, some of the protocol defines, the, the things from MS SMB2 and some of that stuff uh, cleaned up. And so take a look at his presentation. That's very exciting stuff. Okay, so I thought this was actually a really good year for SMB, um, for SMB3 and a really good year for, um, you know, in general for um, you know, some of the kernel driver improvements. We've, we've delayed and delayed and delayed on the SMB3 POSIX extensions. Uh, we've had a relatively large set of things that have shrunk over and over each event, which is good. So what we, I think, are coming pretty close to is prototyping. We'll obviously be at Microsoft next week, so we'll have a chance to try some more stuff. And um, you know, hopefully we can continue to get feedback from you know, other server vendors in the talk tomorrow uh, and other clients um, so we can make sure that we're not missing obvious things. But the um, approach that's being taken where we have this sort of minimal set of options in negotiation uh, looks like it actually makes some sense. And also, I don't want to forget, you know, with David there, that we're also going to show how wonderful Azure Access is from Linux. I think, uh, I, I don't think I have it in my, um, I sent him a, a screenshot of it earlier, but works great. Mounting to a, we're going to show it tomorrow. yeah, yeah, so it's kind of fun. You know, the biggest server in the sky, you know, off, off somewhere. And uh, SMB3 encryption is, you know, we, we forget how cool that is. The fact that I feel comfortable copying data back and forth to some mysterious server in the sky is, uh, I don't feel as comfortable always uploading over HTTP. I don't know. Maybe because I can tell it's encrypted here. So there's a, a really neat set of features that have been done. There's a lot of small things that I haven't dwelt on. But I think that it's important not to lose track of that because a lot of these small little things that we get from Red Hat or SUSE or whatever else, some customer, uh, can be you know, game changers for people. It's fascinating to see the kind of emails we get on the list and the places that SIFS is used. You don't always expect it uh, to be used. But I think we, we want to not lose sight of the big picture. SMB3 has great security features to make sure Linux clients can access them. SMB3, although its metadata performance is a little chatty, in the current implementation, large file I.O. is really fast. It's good. I think we showed last year some of the numbers of you know, NFS compared to SMB3. Um, by the way, we do have to, to, one of the things I'll be checking in is a, some cleanup of ODirect. Right now, we're not passing ODirect. Um, that wouldn't affect the test cases we're talking about there, but it is something to remember that there's some minor um, performance-related cleanup that's going to be going in the next few weeks, like passing the ODirect flag on the wire. Uh, you know, the no buffering equivalent. Um, also, there's a lot of really good stuff going in on Samba. Um, and I think this is also important to realize. 4.7 Samba significantly improves the security, but it also has some really neat improvements. And um, I don't know, are, are any of you guys giving a, Mets, you were giving me a talk tomorrow, right? So, you know, hopefully Mets and others can go through some of those improvements. Okay, so been through some of the major features. Now, an opportunity for you guys to ask questions about uh, you know, specific things uh, that you'd like to see, uh, and also uh, you know, any patches you're aware of or uh, suggestions on how we can get this process going forward. 
Well, uh, something one of our performance guys noticed is that when we open with O direct, uh, opening with O direct, it affects the caching on the client. But in NFS, at least NFS 4, this gets passed all the way. Now, they, they don't, in NFS 3, it's tricky. You, know, you might have to flush all the data. But it's, you know, this odirect is a hint that you want to not cache all the way through. So it's not a requirement, but it is a hint that the server should not cache. Well, we're not sending it on the wire. So when you do an o, open with odirect, we're not sending in a no buffering. Second, when we do, um, when you open with, uh, with data sync, we should be more strict about making sure that the write through flag is always set. You know, F sync works and the stuff works, but it is important to make sure that you're honoring what the app asks for, even if it's painful for Samba. And I think you'll notice that Samba's behavior has changed and gotten a little more strict about how it interprets uh, uh, syncing data to disk. Um, and then I think finally, it's important to remember that there are protocol semantics in SMB3 that are really cool that we don't have equivalents for in the API. And an example I can think of is the ability to set um, on an individual read or write these flags. You know, having an individual write saying, I want this one write through is really cool, but I don't know any way to, if we had some magic way of hinting when to turn that flag on, when we negotiate SMB 302, that'd be kind of fun. Because you know, that is one thing where I can imagine a workload, maybe one of these virtualization workloads they were talking about, where you might want a particular write to go through right through. Um, but, uh, oh yeah, so. Yeah. If we could figure out a way to get that through, I'd be all for it. Right now, I mean, you just have to F-sync it, I guess. Um, but, uh, you know, I want to make sure that we do send, you know, if, if you want to open O-direct, that we tell it, we hint to the server, no buffering. Um, and, and by the way, thanks for the Citrix guys for a lot of the reconnect stuff because you know they did these brutal tests where they were rebooting servers constantly and doing crazy things. We support persistent handles. I don't know if it's something you guys realize, right? We support persistent and we support, you know, you can mount and ask for this um, because you know, obviously in Linux you can't specify it on an open, so you kind of have to say on this mount I want uh, persistent handles. And we ask for durable by default, um, so it's uh, kind of cool. And I, you can even ask for resilient if you want to, I guess, but it's not as interesting for most people. I mean, I'd, I'd like to. As a matter of fact, if I don't know if the Microsoft guys have prototypes we can test against, but we've had in the past the ability to sometimes, uh, you know, as betas get out there, of implementing stuff even while, like, there's no requirement for the kernel stuff that we, we have to wait on. You know, if, if Microsoft has stuff we can test with, let's go for it. I mean, it sounds useful. Um, and, uh, you know, as you saw, Microsoft has been doing some good work, uh, you know, Long Lee and Pavel and others on, um, so it's kind of cool stuff. And maybe they can help out with some of this as well. Okay, what other questions? Interesting questions. Anybody knows what, follow, what, what follows this? Uh, anybody remember? David. Okay, so this is important stuff. So um, I do want to encourage you guys um, to submit kind of requests of things that might be interesting to do. Obviously, we've had some really good work from Red Hat recently, and obviously SUSE. Uh, and I think that uh, that as you saw, the activity was pretty substantially up on SIFS this year. Uh, we had some really good work three years ago, but last year was a little bit less. This year it's way up. So let's get this up. And I think that a lot of the excitement on the POSIX extensions will drive even more because there are certain apps that just fail today without those. So I think that's exciting. So let's all um, take a quick break and enjoy David's presentation, right? Sounds fun. Thank you, guys.